Thank you very much for the kind invitation and uh, thank you all of you for staying for this very last uh, talk uh, of this wonderful day. Um, so we have been hearing a lot about the MSN pregnancy and how the relapses uh, get fewer during the last trimester of pregnancy and now it's my privilege to tell you why this happens. So what my interest um, to this subject uh, was aroused when I was looking after this patient um, in the very beginning of my neurology career. Uh, so she was a patient with uh, Ballos concentric sclerosis and uh, then very soon we learned that she was also pregnant. Uh, so when studying the literature, um, I learned that Ballos concentric sclerosis um, has very poor prognosis, but that pregnancy was the most um, efficient treatment that there was for MS at that uh, time. So we recommended her to continue her pregnancy. She was quite ill, so we had to give her steroids and IVIG and even plasma phoresis, but uh, she made it uh, through. Uh, she had a healthy baby boy who is now a um, 16 year old um, healthy boy and actually her disease, MS disease also stabilized and, and she has been doing quite well. Um, I was really curious why this happens and I was surprised to see that there was very little in the literature to explain why particularly during pregnancy MS gets better. Of course there's a vast uh, pregnancy and immunology um, literature which uh, deals very much with um, pregnancy outcomes and so on uh, but, but not so much uh, about the, the improvement of MS. Uh, normally the immune system rejects everything unfamiliar, but not during pregnancy. Um, so the fetus also uh, is carrying antigens from the father, which are uh, of course um, alien to the mother's immune system and still mother's immune system um, accepts um, the fetus. So mother's immune system changes during pregnancy and this is really necessary to ensure uh, normal development of the fetus. Um, so factors uh, enhancing immune tolerance are strengthened uh, during pregnancy and thanks to this uh, the mother's immune system doesn't reject the fetus and as a side effect uh, to this uh, very fundamental biological phenomenon, also the Th1 type autoimmune uh, diseases ameliorate. So now we know um, that it depends really on the stage of pregnancy what um, the immune uh, events look like. So in very early pregnancy, around uh, the time of implantation, there's actually um, increased um, inflammation, strengthened um, inflammation, and this is necessary for the placenta to develop. Uh, but then in the mid-pregnancy, there's more of an anti-inflammatory environment. But then at the very late pregnancy, there's again more pro-inflammatory environment um, as the body gets um, prepared and ready to get rid of this um, alien growth. Um, so in human pregnancy, the protective mechanisms against rejection of the fetus occur mainly uh, in the placenta at the interface uh, between the mother and child. But the placental immunological changes also regulate the immune uh, responses systemically. And of course it's uh, this um, systemic um, um, immune changes that are more um, readily available um, for studies so it's easy for us to draw blood and, and look 
uh, what's happening in the immune system during preg pregnancy. Um, so here's a picture um, of the placenta, of the phytoplacenta, phyto, um, or the placental unit in the phytomaternal uh, interface. So in red um, is the fetal side, and in green um, is the mother's side, the decidua, and here in the fetal side, mainly the trophoblast cells. And there are some um, um, special tolerogenic molecules and cells in the placenta. So on the fetal side, uh, there's um, HLAG, there's FAS ligand, IDO, and even uh, the uh, checkpoint uh, molecules, PD-1 ligand, has been um, shown to be expressed here in the placenta. And why not, if we need to keep the immune system um, under control? Uh, the same molecules are useful um, in many situations. And then on the mother's side, there are many um, leg re regulatory cells like um, um, uterine NK cells and uh, T regulatory cells. And, and these cells and these molecules sort of fight uh, the, the mother's potentially um, dangerous um, immune cells that might be attacking the fetus. Uh, but this is all reflected also systemically. So, so what we see um, also in mother's blood is an increase um, in remission um, inducing factors such as interleukin-10 or type 1 interference, uh, SOX3. And in this um, uh, environment, uh, we also then have fewer relapses. Um, historically, um, pregnancy was very much viewed as a Th2 uh, phenomenon. So it's, uh, it, it has been considered that um, low estrogen levels, as in uh, normal uh, female levels, are pro-inflammatory and drive uh, Th1 uh, immunity. Uh, but the high estrogen levels, as are um, seen in late pregnancy, they rather uh, enhance the Th2 uh, type immunity. And, and the, they are, are, of course, then responsible to some extent for the uh, pregnancy-related immune changes, but, uh, but also can drive, um, for example, SLE, which uh, is often seen uh, worsening uh, during pregnancy. But now uh, we, of course, know that it's not as simple as purely a Th2 phenomenon, but the immune regulatory mechanisms are much more uh, complicated than this. So it's really the adaptive arm of the immune system um, that's uh, suppressed during pregnancy, particularly the T-cell responses, and the innate uh, side of the immune system um, is uh, activated or strengthened. I guess there has to be something to protect the mother uh, and the fetus from infections, and uh, if we just suppress everything, uh, that's, um, that's uh, harmful and not um, uh, desired. Um, so you see an increase in monocytes and, and granulocytes and in the activation status um, of these cells. Um, so, so this is the, the iconic um, picture or, or image from the Confavre paper um, really showing that in the third trimester relapses are reduced by 70 uh, percent. And um, uh, we started this nationwide study in Finland um, with the aim at looking at, um, at the immunological uh, changes uh, in MS patients during pregnancy. And uh, basically all the hospitals in Finland took part. So we were getting data and also um, um, blood samples uh, from, from the different hospitals. And this was really the first clinical study that um, I 
have been designed design, or I've designed and, and run. And it was amazing to me to see that we actually got exactly the same um, result as, as in this uh, previously published um, uh, study. So showing a, a significant reduction in the relapse rate uh, at uh, the third trimester, but then uh, almost this iris-like uh, rebound activation in, uh, in the first um, three months during pregnant, uh, after pregnancy, and then um, sort of leveling out after that. And uh, we collected uh, blood samples from these patients, but we also did some MRI studies. And, and this um, image here just shows the number of new T2 lesions in the postpartum MRI image, uh, showing that basically all of the image uh, patients uh, did have um, new um, T2 lesions. We didn't do um, GAD enhancing uh, imaging during pregnancy, just for safety reasons, but, uh, but, um, but there's uh, really a clear um, radiological uh, activation, also postpartum. And uh, it, it was quite interesting that we had few cases who actually um, had uh, signs of radiological uh, activation already during the very late uh, stage of pregnancy, sort of reflecting uh, this activation of the, of the immune system in, the, uh, in pre pre preparing for the delivery. This is one of our most extreme cases. Uh, who, she had uh, 200 uh, GAD enhancing lesions in the postpartum phase, but of course this is not, uh, not a common thing. So, so this just reflects, I think, nicely um, the activation of the innate immune system and the general um, pro-inflammatory um, environment of um, pregnancy in that sense. So this is the high sensitivity CRP measurements and, and both in MS patients and in controls um, the, during pregnancy, the high sensitivity CRP levels are higher than uh, after the delivery. We were sort of wondering if uh, the, the sort of the tissue destruction and, um, and events at, in, in labor would be something that could predispose the patients uh, for postpartum relapses, but, but we didn't see any association uh, with um, sort of more elevated CRP and postpartum relapses in this study. Um, as you know, um, there's uh, postpartum thyroiditis associated with um, some autoimmune diseases like, uh, for example, diabetes. And uh, as not much was known about this in, in um, uh, relation to MS, so we also um, had a quick look at this. So we measured uh, uh, thyroid auto um, antibodies, TPO antibodies, and and, th and uh, thyroglobulin uh, antibodies um, in the MS patients during and after uh, pregnancy and found that um, actually there was um, more elevated antithyroid antibodies in MS patients um, than in healthy controls um, in the um, postpartum. Phase, uh, but no uh, actual increase in the incidence of thyroiditis and, mm -hmm. and no increase in abnormal thyroid function tests. But we still feel that um, and think that it's uh, worth monitoring thyroid function uh, during MS pregnancy and postpartum, especially in alemtuzumab uh, treated patients, as we know that these patients are anyway more prone to. Uh, prone for thyroid um, autoimmunity. And often, of course, symptoms of hypothyroidism can be very similar to MS-related uh, fatigue and difficult to distinguish. So we don't know un unless we measure. So, so really, we were interested uh, in uh, which of the many, many different pregnancy-related immune system alterations would be most relevant for the amelioration of multiple sclerosis pregnancy, because of course we naively thought that uh, maybe one could then use this as a, as a new therapeutic um, option or a basis uh, for developing a treatment. And um, so what does one 
So, so, so this is really like uh, looking for a, a needle uh, from a haystack, uh, trying to figure this out. And what does uh, one do when one is looking for a needle in a haystack? So one does uh, transcriptome analysis. So that's what we did. Uh, we did um, uh, this microarray study. We used an immune uh, immunochip with uh, 5,000 immunologically relevant uh, genes. And we compared um, in MS patients um, um, and in healthy controls um, the late pregnancy versus postpartum blood samples. And, and we had a, um, peripheral blood mononuclear cells from uh, healthy blood donors as a reference um, value. And we wanted to identify genes uh, with at least twofold difference in gene expression postpartum versus during the pregnancy in all MS patients, but in none of the healthy control mothers and this our thinking was that maybe this way we could pinpoint like what would be um, really relevant uh, for MS patients. Um, so what we found uh, surprisingly few uh, genes that were upregulated only in MS patients but not in um, healthy controls so six upregulated and only three downregulated. So one of the three downregulated ones was this HLA-G, and, and we already discussed this earlier, uh, that it's, it was one of the molecules, uh, the toler tolerogenic mole molecules in the placenta during pregnancy. And so we looked at this a bit further. So HLA-G um, is a non-classical MHC1 uh, molecule, a class 1B uh, molecule, so it has similarity to M to classical MHC class one, uh, but it has more limited polymorphism. So it has also more limited tissue distribution. It's especially uh, expressed in the placenta, but also in certain tumors, uh, and also in inflamed muscle, and even in the central nervous system and um, lymphocytes. But its main role really uh, in pregnancy um, is to dampen the immune response by uh, interacting with uh, inhibitory receptors on NK cells and T cells. Uh, it has been described uh, on some T cells and uh, suggested that uh, this HLAG expressing T cells would be a novel regulatory T cell population and maybe um, it has importance in controlling inflammation um, and uh, especially in transplantation and tumor in immunology. But uh, Heinz Wiendel published a paper um, where HLAG expression was also shown um, in brain, uh, in my macrophages and microglial cells. And uh, so we teamed up with Heinz and, and then started looking at HLAG in um, MS samples, also at protein level, and we found that um, soluble um, HLAG concentration correlated with relapse status of MS patients. So, so um, patients with um, more uh, postpartum relapses had lower uh, concentration of this tolerogenic uh, HLAG. So. Uh, and the same was actually true also for, um, for T cells. So, so we could create this hypothesis that uh, reduced uh, HLAG expression contributes to the disbalance of the autoreactive T cells in MS patients in the postpartum stage. Um, so what about uh, um, lymphocyte subtypes during uh, MS pregnancy? So this was obviously uh, one of the first um, things we, we did just for screening. And um, so what's very clear is the reduction in the NK cells during pregnancy, but this is not uh, specific for MS. Uh, it also happens uh, in, in normal pregnancy. Uh, not much is happening in, in other lymphocyte uh, subtypes. And um, then we Notice that it actually the uh, CD56 bright um, NK cells um, were increased during a late pregnancy, um, whereas the uh, CD56 um, low NK cells were reduced. 
And there was also a predominance of Th2 cytokines uh, during um, MS pregnancy. So to summarize um, the pregnancy and immune regulation in MS, so the adaptive immune responses are dampened, um, the innate immune responses are strengthened, Tregs are increased, both um, the FOXP3 uh, Tregs and the HLAG Tregs, and the regulatory NK cells are also increased during pregnancy. And the downregulation of soluble HLAG uh, and HLAG plus Tregs was associated with risk of postpartum relapse. Okay, just a few words um, about uh, pregnancy um, and MS and sex hormones. So here, uh, again, the relapse rate during pregnancy and postpartum, and here um, the concentration of progesterone and estrogen during uh, pregnancy and then uh, postpartum. So. So in the third trimester of pregnancy, um, there's really a high concentration of estrogen and progesterone. And um, as was already discussed earlier, so in terms of estrogens, um, there's now thought to be these two-tier effects uh, to the immune system with um, low estrogen levels, levels or normal female levels uh, stimulating the immune responses, whereas high estrogen levels, such as in late pregnancy, um, they prevent inflammatory response, uh, responses. But now there's also evidence um, uh, that estrogen has um, neuroprotective um, effects. There's been a couple of studies done um, in MS using um, um, estrogens. And so it's estriol, so E3, which is the, the estrogen hormone that's um, um, elevated really um, during pregnancy. And uh, this estriol has, has been then also used um, in these clinical studies. So eight milligrams per estriol per day um, um, brings the estrogen levels up to the level that you find in the late uh, pregnancy. And uh, the first, uh, the pilot study, um, which um, used MRI uh, as an outcome measure has really had really uh, promising results. Uh, so reduction in the um, T2 lesion load um, with the estriol treatment. And, and then when the treatment was stopped, uh, the lesions came back. And then um, when it was reinitiated, uh, the lesions went. So I think that, that looked really nice. Uh, then, um, uh, a phase 2b study was done where estriol was combined with uh, glatiramer acetate um, and, um, and, and compared to placebo plus glatiramer acetate. And also here, there was a slight reduction in, in uh, relapses, but, but it didn't quite reach uh, statistical significance. And, um, and luckily, the investigators uh, haven't given up, but there's yet a third uh, study ongoing. Uh, progesterone was also tested um, in um, preventing um, postpartum relapses, but, but uh, it didn't, um, it, it wasn't able to prevent the relapses. So estriol, um, so, so estrogen receptor is made of um, alpha and beta chains, and uh, estriol binds mainly to the beta chain. And, and the, in a way, this is a good thing because uh, so the, the toxic effects um, to breasts um, and uterus, for example, they are mediated through the alpha receptor. So, so now there ha have been some attempts to um, create uh, or develop ligands that would directly bind to the uh, estrogen receptor beta uh, in order to uh, avoid these harmful uh, effects. And uh, there are promising results from animal studies. Um, and yeah, so, so, so also the ER beta effects are uh, neuroprotective uh, in animal models and, and in principle they could be also given to, to males. 
Um, so few words about testosterone. So also with testosterone, there's um, evidence of neuroprotective effects uh, in animal studies. And uh, there's been few very small studies just with uh, 10 patients, uh, which show that um, testosterone uh, leads to increased production of uh, neuroprotective mediators in, in vitro by immune cells. And, and uh, another study um, showing that maybe there's an improvement in cognition and brain atrophy, but I mean, what, what can you really tell from 10 patients? So uh, this is just to summarize um, the effect of the hormones. So high dose <coughs> estrogen as seen in pregnancy, um, cytoprotection and um, reduction uh, in um, inflammation and improved um, cell mediated disease during pregnancy, but worsened uh, antibody mediated disease. Pro progesterone similarly anti-inflammatory effects androgens, um, immune effects large, largely suppressive and beneficial for autoimmunity. But uh, prolactin, uh, prolactin uh, mostly has uh, pro-inflammatory effects and uh, tendency to worsen autoimmune disease. So if we think about prolactin um, in uh, nervous, um, central nervous system autoimmunity. So again, um, it has this uh, dual role. So prolactin can uh, promote CNS repair and be useful in that sense, uh, but it also promotes um, the inflammatory um, actions of the immune system and, and there, thereby uh, promotes CNS damage. So um, it's really um, still a mystery to me uh, what the biology uh, behind the proposed uh, positive um, effects of uh, breastfeeding on MS relapses, on, on the uh, re yeah, re redu reduced um, relapse number um, due to breastfeeding is. Uh, but we certainly know that um, breastfeeding is um, useful uh, both for the mother and the infant. Uh, so it has been shown that uh, breastfeeding actually accelerates mother's recovery from the delivery. Uh, it helps mother with weight control. Uh, it advances the emotional connection between mother and child. Um, but then also there's great benefits for the infant, um, like uh, protection from infections. Um, and also uh, it's a very good uh, form of nutrition to the, to the infant. And there's really long-term beneficial effects for mother and child, and it's also environmentally friendly and cheap. So why not, if, if you can? Um, so then just one um, last thing. Um, so pregnancy isn't really an immunosuppressive state. It's more of an immunomodulated uh, state. But still related to the um, um, altered T cell function, um, there may be increased susceptibility to certain infections. And definitely uh, an increase in incidence has been um, described in, uh, for Listeria and malaria infections. And several um, infections can also be much uh, more severe during pregnancy, probably because of this um, immune um, uh, or this, this uh, modulated um, immune responses. And unfortunately, these um, more severe um, infections uh, can result with uh, unfavorable pregnancy outcomes uh, like spontaneous abortion or intrauterine gr growth um, restriction or preterm labor. So of course, um, Mothers these days are instructed uh, not to eat any uncooked vegetables or fish uh, in order to um, avoid Listeria infection. Um, since we are using these uh, drugs that are, uh, potentially um, can increase uh, the infection risk, I think uh, we, we also need to uh, think about this aspect um, a little bit. and. Um, 
there was an interesting uh, paper um, by uh, PML researchers uh, where they had um, looked whether um, PML would occur also in individuals with minimal uh, immunosuppression. Of course, we are used to the dogma that PML only occurs in uh, association with HIV or, or more severe immunosuppression, but, uh, but, but uh, these uh, investigators found um, uh, 38 PML cases um, in individuals with very, very uh, minor immunosuppression. And interestingly, two of these patients were pregnant um, women uh, who didn't have any other um, uh, immunosuppressive um, factor. So, so I, I think uh, we need to sort of keep this in mind, especially if we are choosing to treat our patients with uh, um, natalizumab during pregnancy, and, and especially patients who might uh, be JC virus positive. And um, so actually we were addressing this um, question a little bit. Uh, we, we studied the humoral immune responses to JC virus in pregnant MS. Uh, patients and, and found um, that, that their, their humoral responses were changed um, during MS pregnancy and without going more uh, into the, um, details in, in this study, uh, I, I just want to remind that let's, let's keep this uh, in mind um, if, if uh, choosing to um, treat patients with natalizumab during pregnancy. Okay, but I think uh, I'm at the end of my talk. This is Finland, not, not at the moment, but in the, in the summer. <laughs> so this is our, our group uh, in the um, archipelago. We had a writing camp, uh, we writing papers. Um, so my group at the moment uh, is mostly studying progressive MS uh, using uh, PET imaging. Uh, just last week, we made our first appearance in the social media. We started with Facebook, so you can find us um, with Aira's group um, on Facebook. We are posting about um, our research and anything related uh, to MS. And um, I thank you for your attention, and I'm happy to take questions. Thank you.